Are you ready to learn a little bit about the lie and the witch in the wardrobe? So how many of you have read the book or seen the movie? Okay, well, there are very few that haven't, so the plot probably won't be as necessary, but I got a feeling that for a few of you it's been a while since you read the story. So we're ready to start into the lie and the witch in the wardrobe. I'm going to start... <coughs> excuse me, with uh, the covers of three different devotional booklets, two Advent ones and one Latin one. <coughs> excuse me, the Creative Communications for the Parish asked me to write. And since Lent is coming up, I brought a few copies, and so if you already have one, don't take one, but if you want one, and you're sitting in the front row, take one, and then Whoever does, however many are left, pass them back, and until they run out, uh, they're available. <coughs> Both are all gone, but I do have copies for five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The story of one who is not a tame lion. We're getting geared up again. So as we saw last time in the dedication page to this book, it's dedicated to Lucy Barfield. And Lewis uses a little bit of humor, so we'll embed some of the humor in each of the stories. So are we ready to go? So, and as Lewis gives us a little bit of the lighter side, he's also doing one of those intrusions as the author he speaks to the reader. And here he says from chapter 14, after the witch has slain Aslan and other creatures, are there at the stone table where Aslan died. Well, I won't describe, because if I did, the grown-ups would probably not let you read this book. <laughs> he talks about giant uh, Rumblebuffin, who is one of the stone creatures that is brought to life again in the witch's courtyard of her castle. Giants of any sort are now so rare in England, and so few giants are good-tempered, that ten to one you have never seen a giant when his face was beaming. How many of you have seen a giant with his face beaming? Just raise your hand if you see. See, he's right, isn't he? It's a sight well worth looking at. And the last example of Lewis's humor, when Professor Kirk is wondering about these uh, Pevensey children, he says, bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? The very last chapter of the book is a leave Narnia and come back in through the wardrobe back to the professor's house where they had ended up living during World War II because of the bombing going on in London. So we continue with our introduction to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Again, there's the cover of the 50th anniversary book, and then there's a poster from when the movie came out. Moral development, telling the truth. So, we talked about this in the first hour. As an example, there are many examples in each of the books. Lewis writes, Lucy was a very truthful girl. That's on the one side, that's, that's something that's held up as a positive virtue. On the other side, the witch's house, she says to Edmund, there are whole rooms full of Turkish delight. We know that's a lie. She says, I want a nice boy whom I could bring up as a prince and who would be king of Narnia when I'm gone. The truth of the matter is she wants to get the four children into her castle so she can turn them to stone and maintain her rule in Narnia. Edmund, early on in the story, says when Lucy says, you don't look so good, he says, I'm all right. But this is not true. He was feeling very sick. So it's very clear when somebody's telling the truth, that's a positive thing. When somebody's telling a lie, uh, that's a negative thing. And kids reading this are able to figure that out. and. Truth telling is encouraged by the reading of the story, as well as many other Christian virtues. Some background to the story. So Lewis first started writing this chronicle in 1939, and uh, he painted himself into a corner, stopped, we still have the fragment where he wrote a few pages and then didn't know where to go from there, and he laid it aside, and he picked that up again later on. Started all over again in the summer of 1948, Finished spring of 1949, I, like you needed to know that, right? Published in 1950, so uh, the 50th anniversary, already 17 years ago. 
and we heard about how this book started, as well as the other Chronicles of Narnia, as well as the Space Trilogy or Ransom Trilogy, which is science fiction for adults. George Thayer was one of Lewis's students, later on became an English literature professor himself at Malvern College, which is a prep school for the university, and uh, was a very good friend of Lewis and probably still the primary biographer of Lewis because he's a guy that knew Lewis personally, was in Lewis's home, and had Lewis to his home many times. He would remind us as an English professor that Lewis would say, it's there for the story. First and foremost, it's there for the story. So read the story, enjoy the story as a story. And having done that, if you want to dig a little bit deeper and look at moral development or look at the power of story or look at some Christian parallels, you can do that. But remember, the first thing, as a good writer, it's there for the story. Lewis uh, once asked if he made up, uh, if, he, if he had four children in mind, and he said no, and just made them up. Although the Lucy name is suspiciously like the girl to whom the book is dedicated. So ten facts about the series. Pevensey, the last name of the four children. Did you know that Pevensey Bay is the place where the Normans landed in 1066 AD under William the Conqueror? But you didn't know that. Well, okay, now you do. The name's Kirk and McCready. Professor Kirk is the house where the four children come to live during the bombing of London. This is out in the country. McCready is the housekeeper. So Diggory Kirk is his full name. He's Professor Kirk here. Kirk, Scottish form of the word church. Possibly Kirk is a tribute to one of his old teachers by the name of William Kirkpatrick. And as boys, Jack and Warren had a housekeeper named Mrs. McCready, believe it or not. Big Wardrobe and Spare Room is the name of a train station in Edith Nesbitt's story, the Aunt and Amabel. And there's a little bit, uh, uh, you have to read the story <coughs> to understand how that works its way in A Line of the Witch and the Wardrobe, but Tumnus gets a little bit of confused about where Lucy is from. Modesty is one of the four cardinal virtues of the Middle Ages. Lewis is holding up all four cardinal virtues. This is one of them. So Mr. Beaver is modest about his beaver dam is not quite completed. But he, then again, he's proud but modest. Lewis was very modest about his book, even though it's a bestseller. Animal characters. Uh, when the four children are thinking of different uh, animals they'd like to be like, uh, they kind of fit. Peter is the oldest and the leader of the group. He is an eagle, he's a stag, he's a hawk. Lucy thinks of badgers. Edmund thinks of snakes, and he's the guy that goes bad for a time in the story. Slytherin, anyone? Yeah. And Susan <laughs> thinks of foxes. She has a good head on her shoulders. Fur coats. Lucy enjoys the fur coats in that wardrobe, foreshadows her enjoyment of Aslan's fur. Uh, moral choices are made by Mr. Tumnus, by Peter, by, and uh, in dealing with Fenris Ulf, who is the head of the witch's collection of wolves that are in her employ. He, Fenris Ulf is the name in the American version of the book, Maldrum is the name of that same wolf in the British version of the book, in case you wondered. Their uh, moral choices, the choices of the wolves are to, to kill and to do whatever the witch tells them to do, no matter what. Towards the end of the story, as they become kings and queens of Narnia, they are given new names. Peter, the High King, <coughs> is called Peter the Magnificent. Susan, the Gentle, Edmund, the Just, which is interesting, a sort of rags to riches story, because he was the traitor in the story and Lucy the Valiant. <coughs> so uh, this is a bit of a stretch, but some people ask from time to time, where does the Doctrine of the Trinity show up in the line of the wardrobe? And uh, yeah, Aslan is, of course, the son of God, the son of the emperor beyond the sea. God the Father is the emperor beyond the sea. And the closest thing to uh, the Holy Spirit is Father Christmas, or Santa Claus, that shows up in the story because he being, brings gifts, especially as the winter in Narnia gradually begins to thaw. 
and last dedication page. Told you about that, read the dedication. Lucy Barfield later on got mul multiple sclerosis. And uh, the story of Aslan, renewal of all things, where Lewis says in the book, and when he, Aslan, shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. Uh, that happened for Lucy Barfield. She's no longer alive, but though the multiple sclerosis affected her health and well-being in this life, she has a new body in the resurrection. We move on from there. Dunluce Castle, I'll show you a picture of this. David C. Downing thinks that Lewis got the idea for the castle in the Lion, the Witch, and Wardrobe from this castle because we happen to know that he and his brother and his mother took summer vacations on the northern coast of Northern Ireland and saw Dunluce Castle. So as you see there on the screen, built in the 13th century, the last chapter of the book, as the sea goes away, sea water, smell of the sea, it owes a lot to Castle Rock and Portrush, two towns on the very coast, northern coast of Northern Ireland. This is the castle from the movie, <coughs> a little bit more elaborate than Dunluce, and here is Pauline Bain's drawing in the next slide of Kier Paravel. Okay, this is uh, Google, Google Maps, and uh, we scroll down, we get a couple of arrows to point to Castle Rock and Port Rush. And we know from family letters that they did vacation there more than once. The next slide will give you a wide angle view of this same territory. And we scroll down once and we get where the arrow is pointing to. So, Belfast would be on the eastern coast of Northern Ireland, the major city of Northern Ireland, and the family in the summertime while Dad was staying at home in Belfast doing his legal work. He was a lawyer, a solicitor in uh, the UK system. Mom and the boys would go to the seashore and enjoy uh, swimming in the, the ocean, playing on the sand, and doing various other things. Just a brief note on the order of the reading of the Seven Chronicles of Narnia. In what order should I read them? Should I read them in chronological order in Narnian time, which is the way Harper Collins has published the book these days, or should I read them in the order in which Lewis wrote them? After Mr. Beaver had said the name Aslan, we read in the text of this first book, none of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. So the name Aslan is spoken for the very first time in a sort of a hush. And if you read the line of Witch and Wardrobe first, and I know it's too late for most of you, or maybe you did read that one first among the seven, uh, when you did read them for the first time, uh, if you have read one of the others, you don't have the same experience that the four children do when they hear the name Aslan for the first time. One other point on this topic, so we get to experience aha when we read The Magician's Nephew after The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because that tells us where the lamppost came from and the talking animals, how they got to Narnia and where the wardrobe came from and the professor and all this stuff. Uh, we get to enjoy those aha moments by reading them in the order in which Lewis wrote them and that's the way I recommend if you did it the other way uh, we'll have confession and absolution. <laughs> no, really, it, it's not that big a deal. So whatever way you read them is fine. Uh, if you haven't read them and you decide to, I recommend reading them in the order in which Lewis wrote the series. So what about Narnian time? The time when the four children get to Narnia is the year 1000. In England, it's 1940. Anybody know when World War II began? 1939, okay, so the war is on. Jadis, the white witch, the, the villain of the story, returned to Narnia in 898. The long winter began in 900, so it's been winter for a hundred years. Can you imagine? The weather we have in Edmonton right now, 
for a hundred years. Is that depressing or what? Unless you're a big hockey fan, maybe uh, uh, if, if you don't mind that. So uh, at the end of the story, they hunt the white stag in the year 1015, and that's how they get back. You see the the lamp post there on the right side. Uh, as you we scroll down, I've got it in a in circle. So there's the lamp post. They're trying to find the white stag because if they catch him, they'll get whatever wish they want. And they see the lamp post and they remember, and they end up wandering back through the wardrobe and come into the professor's house at precisely. Probably one second after they had entered into the wardrobe um, 15 years ago in Narnian time. So, a little bit more about Narnian time in the uh, next slide. This is a couple of pages that I scanned from a book by Paul Ford. This is sort of the Encyclopedia of Narnia. It's called Companion to Narnia. Ford is a seminary professor in, in California. And this is England time here, so Diggory Kirk's birth. And uh, then uh, one foul, or 1900, the magic rings. Well, this is from the magician's nephew. 1949 ends the story from the English time, from 1888 to 1949. And here is where the four children come into Narnia in 1940. And so Narnian time is this arc on the, the top center to the right and down to here, from the year one of creation story told in The Magician's Nephew to the year 2555 that is the tail end of the very last of the Seven Chronicles of Narnia. And then we relate the different points in the story uh, with these lines that connect Narnian time with English time. So if you go to, if you're in England and you go to Narnia and then you come back, you get to Narnia a year later, which is true of the second book in the series, there are about 1,300 years that have gone by. But the difference between the second story and the third story, they get back to Narnia again, but only, I think, three years have passed that time. So the time scheme works differently in these two parallel worlds, and we never know how it's going to be until we get there. So enough on Narnian time. The first words of the book uttered by a Narnian character, Mr. Thomas, are goodness, gracious me. And as we will see, goodness and grace will pay, play fundamental roles throughout the story. This is one of the repeated phrases that's very important in the story, always winter and never Christmas. What a depressing thought. I mean, we can deal with winter. Some people love cold weather. And they love the sledding, the skating, whatever is going on, whatever you enjoy doing. Um, but to have it always winter and never Christmas, that, that's not so good. The next uh, uh, phrase, uh, the four thrones that care parallel. There is a prophecy in this book that those four thrones that are currently empty as the story begins are going to be filled one day by two humans, two sons of Adam, two daughters of Eve. And the last phrase only appears once but it's a very, very important one that Aslan is not a tame lion. So he's a bit unpredictable, but he is a good lion, even though he's not all that tame. You never know what he's going to come up with next. This uh, image from Pauline Baines, by the way, is uh, after winter has begun to thaw, because Aslan has arrived, the witch's power is weakening, so some of the talking animals in Narnia are having a little party, and who should happen to come along but the white witch, and she thinks that this is gluttony, and this is waste, and shouldn't be happening, and it's against her uh, orders, and so she turns them all to stone again. So, But anyway, we go on from there. Here's the storyline. So because of the war, World War II, these four children have been moved out of London to a large country home that is a historic home. The tours get taken through as people are told about the history of this house. And they're living there in the professor's house. His name is Kirk. His first name is Diggory, but we don't know it's Diggory Kirk until later on in the series of seven. They get into Narnia through this wardrobe. When Mrs. McCready is taking a tour through the house, uh, she says, whatever you do, don't interfere with the tours when we have visitors coming through. 
And so she starts a tour and they we got to get out of her way. We don't want to be caught. And so they, they're scrambling around this huge house and she se almost seems to be tracking them down. They go into an empty room. They find the wardrobe. They see the doorknob start to turn. They've got to get inside this wardrobe, this portable closet for coats and things. So they get into the wardrobe and uh, they end up going into, now I'm cutting out some parts of the story because Lucy uh, get, got in there before all three of them and Lucy and Edmund also got in a second time before all four of them went to Narnia together for the very first time as a group. So they find out that the Narnia is under this spell cast by the witch. There are a lot of creatures that have been turned to stone uh, under her rule but it's always winter and she can get around on a sled that's drawn by reindeer and she is ruling this country with an iron fist. The four children have been prophesied. They at first don't believe it's about them, but this is the prophecy right here. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bones sits at care parallel and throne, the evil time will be over and done. I know that doesn't rhyme, but it's spelled about the same, right? <laughs> Should I say don? Yeah. Maybe it was pronounced that way at yeah. some point, right? Or maybe some of you do that. I don't know. So Edmund <coughs> has gotten there with Lucy uh, the second time she got in. And he met the witch when she wasn't around. And uh, she tries to convince him to bring her. When she finds out there for them and remembers the prophecy, she tries to convince him to bring his two sisters and brother to her castle because she wants to welcome them and she really wants to turn them to stone but he thinks she's okay and uh, she says do you want something to eat he wants turkish delight which is a british infection anybody ever had turkish delight okay there are recipes on the internet so if you want to make some and find out what it tastes like i'm not crazy about it myself but you can just google it and find a recipe and make it and uh, bring it next week for refreshment <laughs> <laughs> other people can try that too Okay, the story continues. So, as they get into Narnia, the four of them, they meet a robin who leads them to a beaver, and the beaver takes them to his beaver lodge, because he knows about the prophecy as well. And then, while they're at the beaver's lodge, it sneaks away when they're not looking, because he wants to go to the witch's castle, as he's doing here uh, in this drawing, and uh, see who's lying on the threshold of the entrance to the castle inside the courtyard. It's a walled castle, and inside the courtyard he's got men. He's about to step over the body of Fenris Ulf, thinking it's just another one of the stone statues that litters her courtyard, not realizing this is a live wolf, and doesn't exactly attack him, but scares the daylights out of him. So Aslan has come back to Narnia, as be the beaver tells the four children, and Narnia is beginning to thaw. It's been all, the river has been frozen, all kinds of snow. She gets her sled out in order to try to get to the four children at the beaver's home, the beaver's dam. So uh, skipping through a few of the details to cut to the chase, there is a point in the story where they all get to uh, where Aslan is camping, a place called Aslan's Howe, and uh, the witch arrives and she says to Aslan, you have a traitor in your midst and by rights, by the rules on which Narnia was built, every traitor's blood is owed me. So you have to turn Edmund over to me and I will slay him because I've got that blood coming to me. And so they have a little bit of dialogue. Aslan says, well, let's talk privately and they have a private conversation. The end of the conversation, everybody learns that Edmund has been, she has released her claim on Edmund. What they don't know is that he agreed to substitute for Edmund. And he doesn't tell anybody. Later that night, he starts to walk to the stone table where he's going to give up his life for Edmund. But Lucy and Susan see what's happening. They have trouble sleeping, and so they follow him until he notices them. So at the stone table, our resurrection coming, well first we gotta have Good Friday and then we'll have Easter Sunday. But uh, they get to the stone table, uh, he gives himself up powerful enough to, to slay all of them if he wanted, 
but they tie him up, drag him to the stone table, they shave his mane off of him so he looks much less menacing, and then with the stone knife that reappears in the story, anybody know what story it reappears? Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, towards the end of the journey, but she slays Aslan and he's dead there on the stone table, and Susan and Lucy are there sobbing and wondering what they'll do, and they're walking back and forth on top of this hill. As they're at the other end of the hill, they hear a loud crack at the very dawn, as the sun begins to rise, they turn and they see the body is missing. What happened? Did they take his body? And all of a sudden, Aslan appears as the sun is rising, according to the movie at least. And uh, then they have this resurrection. Well, the resurrection has occurred. Then they have this romp on the, the hillside and they sort of play tag. And then he tells them to get on his back because uh, after she slew Aslan, she and all of the ogres and witches and, and uh, minotaurs and other ghouls and goblins and werewolves and stuff are going to, to fall upon Peter and Edmund and the rest of Aslan's company who are gathering together in order to fight the witch. The witch has her magical powers. She has a wand that she can point at a creature and turn it to stone. So she's got a huge advantage plus a larger army than Peter and Edmund have behind them. So he goes with the two girls, come to the witch's castle, breathe onto all these stone creatures, brings them to life so they have reinforcements and they head to the place where the final climactic battle is to take place. And our last, I think this is our last bullet, final climactic battle, which is stretched out uh, into a lengthy battle scene in the movie, in the book, it's about a page and a half, yeah. so, uh, that, but that's Hollywood for you, right? Okay, so there you have the story. <clears throat> well, one last thing. In the very last chapter, Peter, Susan, Evan, and Lucy are on the throne, and we do have a little bit more <coughs> yet, because uh, they then end up chasing after the white stag. They see the lamppost, and they remember all the, the war. This brings back some memories, and they go through the wardrobe and come back into the professor's house through the wardrobe, at the very same time that they had left, 15 years earlier in Narnia time. So this next slide is the uh, map of Narnia. I said I'd show you in a little bit more detail later on. I've got a couple of bullets to scroll down to show you where, where Aslan's How is. So this is uh, Aslan's How right here, where the stone table is, where Aslan gave up his life. Here's Care Parabell, the castle. This is a blue this up a little bit. You lose a little bit of the uh, fine detail when you blow it up, but uh, an arrow pointing to Aslan's how again at the Great River. Scroll down. Right, oh there. Okay, and Care Parabel uh, here on the seacoast. Okay, now you've been in our name. So biblical theme number one, deep and deeper magic. The witch says to Aslan, when she comes to demand Edmund's blood, fool, or no, this is, this is at the stone table, I'm sorry. So Aslan has given himself up, he's bound in the stone table, about to die. She says, now I will kill you instead of the human traitor, and so the deep magic will be appeased. And then she says, and what's to prevent me from going and killing him too? So you have lost despair and die. So that's the deep magic. But there is deeper magic uh, that she didn't know about. So let's look up, uh, since uh, probably Ezekiel is the hardest one to get to, I'm going to go there and uh, I'd like somebody to read Genesis 2.17. I'll then uh, read Ezekiel 18.4. Somebody else go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 13, and uh, somebody in 1 Peter 1. So who's got Genesis 2, 17, the creation account of Adam and Eve? Yes. Okay. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, so part of the creation account, what uh, Adam and Eve could eat from and what they could not. This is part of the magic, so to speak, what God uh, built into the world and the Garden of Eden at the time that he created it. 
Ezekiel 18, verse 4. For every living soul belongs to me, the Father as well as the Son, both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. So Edmund, having committed the sin, was doomed to die. The witch knew it. In a certain sense, every one of us fits into that category. Revelation 13, 8. Anybody volunteer to read that? All inhabitants of the earth will worship inhabitants. I'm sorry. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All the all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb, that was slain from the creation of from the creation of the world. The Lamb, Jesus, who was slain from the creation of the world. It was part of God's plan that the Son of God die for the sins of the world even before there was such a thing as sin. He knew what was going to happen. That's rather impressive to me. How about 1 Peter 1, 20? He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So God acts in grace in eternity, even before the creation of the world, plans the redemption of the human race before it occurs. Any other uh, thoughts or comments on any of these verses as they relate to the story of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Or some insight that the, what of the verses actually uh, spoke to you about? Something coming in online? Okay. We talked about some of the verses as we went through. So the witch knew about the magic. Satan knew about uh, sin bringing about death. But I got a feeling that Jesus did a little bit of judo on Satan. He thought he had won, right? And the witch thought she had won at the moment that Aslan died. So let's go on from there. This is uh, the deeper magic. That was the deep magic. The soul who sins shall die, Ezekiel 18.4. Uh, that was set up when God created in Genesis 2. Redemption plan, Revelation 13.8. When a willing victim, Lewis writes, who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead. And this, by the way, is the stone table event and Aslan is being dragged up to the stone table. If that scares you, cover your eyes, don't look at it. <laughs> The table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. In other words, that's Lewis's imaginative way of describing resurrection. Let's go on. Biblical theme two, the terminology, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. <laughs> Phrasing borrowed from William Morris, a favorite novelist of the 19th century that Lewis loved reading. G.K. Chesterton said the simplest truth about man is that he's a very strange being, almost in the sense of being a stranger on the earth. Alexander Pope, an English writer, humanity is the glory, jest, and riddle of the world. Interesting way of putting it, what people are like. And uh, Socrates, I want to know about myself. Am I a monster more complicated and swollen with passion than the serpent typho? Or a creature of a gentler and simpler Sword. So this human race that we find ourselves as a part of is a bit uh, unique and uh, puzzling at times as well. So let's go on from there. So this is the uh, poem I quoted earlier, when Adam's flesh and Adam's bones sits at Kier Parabell and throne, the evil time will be over and gone. <laughs> so I've got, I think, four passages here. Psalm 8. And Matthew 19, first of all. I'll go to Matthew 19. Somebody go to Psalm 8, which is a psalm that talks about the glory of mankind's creation. And somebody to read verses 3 and 4 and stop. And then somebody else read verses 5 and 6, please. And those that are following online can look at these at the same time that we're reading or just listen carefully. 
when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Okay, so at first glance, the heavens declare the glory of God, majesty, power, vast distances, beauty, and then, you know, who am I? Just a, a little flea flick in the light of the rest of that. However, verses 5 and 6. You made, him a little, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Just a little bit less than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. So, to be a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve is indeed a very lofty position, even in the midst of this vast universe. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, to his 12 disciples, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the followers of Jesus, those original 12, will have significant roles in the kingdom. And I've got to believe that God's got stuff for us to do after this life is over. I don't know what it is, but when we get there, we'll find out. So God has invested us with the image of God with tremendous glory and honor. A couple of more passages as we scroll down. First of all, Lewis, it is a serious thing to live in a society of gods and goddesses. To imagine that your next door neighbor might be someone that you could either be tempted to fall down and worship if you went one direction, or to shun as a, a, almost a demon from hell. So every person around us in our community, in our neighborhood, is somebody who's going to live forever into eternity. And Lewis in this essay, it's actually a sermon called The Way to Glory, talks about the responsibility God has given each of us to be a witness, to move other people or to encourage other people towards God rather than the opposite direction. Professor Kirk in uh, The Language and Wardrobe makes the comment, once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but did you know that you're royalty? Did you know that we are sons and daughters of the king, made in the image of God, the king of the universe, uh, the Jews like to use that phrase, the, the king of the universe. Uh, blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe, <clears throat> eternal king of the universe. So uh, we are a royal priesthood. Peter says in 1 Peter, echoing uh, Exodus 19, and royal means that we have royalty in our blood because God has made us in his image. Let's move on from there. So uh, Lucy and the trilemma. Early on in the story, Peter and Susan are a bit worried about Lucy. She's, is she delusional? Is she in her right mind? Is she lying? What's going on here talking about this world that, that is in the wardrobe, and when we check it out, there's nothing there. And Edmund says they were only making it up, so they go and they talk to Professor Kirk. There's Lucy in the house of Tumnus in the, in the drawing. So that's the context of uh, Peter and Susan going to talk to Professor Kirk. Professor Kirk says there are three options for Lucy and what she's talking about this land of Narnia. And he lays out the three options. And after he bemoans the fact that they're not thinking logically, logic, said the professor half to, himself, to himself, why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. And the next slide gives us the three. There's Professor Kirk. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious that she is not mad for the moment then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. Flabbergasting for Peter and Susan. But uh, what we don't know at this point is that Professor Kirk himself was once in Narnia. Well, we move on. <coughs> I shift gears to the mere Christianity where Lewis gives a more full-blown adult uh, logical 
parallel to that little episode in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that Lewis did in a very imaginative way with Professor Kirk, Peter, and Susan. In the shocking alternative, one of the chapters in the middle of Mere Christianity, Lewis pre presents Jesus as one of three options. There are only three, there are other options, but these are the three main ones that have been suggested for him. Either he's Lord, or liar, or lunatic. And he writes, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, <coughs> or else he would be the devil of hell. He goes on. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any, English would say, patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Same argument we saw in the line which the wardrobe. We see in a more full-blown version of mere Christianity. So, this is quiz time. There are only seven questions. They're multiple choice. Anybody can answer. And uh, there's one tricky one in here. So, let's just go to the first question. Lucy entered Narnia through the wardrobe how many times? Once, twice, three, or four? Anybody? Three. Three, yes, correct. Scroll down. Answer is C. Next question, the first to risk his life for another was Professor Vaughn Asplund or Rumble Buffett. Let's see the answer. It's <coughs> the Fawn. It's the Fawn. If you haven't read the book, you probably wouldn't get it. You wouldn't get it from my telling of the story or retelling the story if you've already read it. But it is the Fawn who is supposed to turn Lucy in, according to the witches demands, he just didn't have the heart to do it, and so he let her go. Third question. At the sound of his roar, blank will be no more. This is the trick question. Sorrow. Sorrow. Number four. The name of the white witch was Jada, Lilith, Wanda, or Samantha. Remember that television show with Samantha? The, what, she wiggle her nose and disappear? Okay, the answer is A, Jada. Question five. Peter obeyed Aslan and risked his life. If you haven't read the story, you won't know this, but somebody will, I think. Killing the wolf in order to save Edmund, Susan, Lucy, or the farm. Susan. Okay. Number six. Aslan died for the sins of Adam, all humankind, Jadis, Edmund. Edmund, easy one. Okay. And the last one. Four kings and queens were finally led back to this world by a creature the fauna told Lucy about on her first visit. Talking Robin, Magic White Stag, Mr. Beaver, Red Dwarf. Yeah, the White Stag. Very good. Okay. I think you passed. <laughs> All right, let's go on here. Benediction to, uh, i got to tell you about these benedictions. I've got one for each of the seven Chronicles of Narnia, not written by me, uh, but there is a woman by the name of Kathleen uh, Linsku who wrote one of the best books on Narnia. It's called Journey to Narnia. She actually did a master's thesis on Narnia in the 1950s. She's no longer alive, but... Um, she once wrote to Lewis and, and, he, and sent her a copy of her thesis, and he told her that she understood Narnia even better than he did, so she's really good with this. She's, and I actually borrow questions for the, the factual quiz from that book as well. But she wrote these benedictions, and remember this is a supposal of what we can think in terms of Christian theology as we do this benediction. May Aslan restore all names to their proper owners. May the warmth of his breath come over us. May his breath 
bring the stone parts of us to life. May we live on both sides of the wardrobe door. P.S. As Queen Susan said at the end of the story, as they're chasing after the white stag, trying to decide whether they should do it or not, let's go on and take the adventure that shall fall to us, shall we? Come back uh, next week. Uh, scroll down and see what books we're doing next. So this is the Pauline Baines drawing of them coming out of the wardrobe at the end of the story in the last chapter. So we will do books two and three in the sequence in which Lewis wrote them. So Prince Caspian and then the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. We'll do Prince Caspian in the first hour. Take our break. Voyage of the Dawn Treader in the second hour. And uh, as they say in Texas, y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs> See you then. Thank you for your time.